Hey everyone, it's Jamie Batch, your instructor for Bio 204 AMP2, and we are diving into chapter 25, which covers our like electrolyte balance and acid base balance and, and um, some of the kind of overall big picture stuff that goes on in our body. So we only have one body system left. Up until this point in your AMP education, we've covered everything, right? We started all the way back last semester talking about the integumentary system and bones and muscles and the nervous system and hormones right and then this semester we focused on the cardiovascular the lung physiology right we also talked about digestive and lymphatic and immunity and last week we were talking about the urinary system well all of that exists and um persists because of the built-in feedback mechanisms coordinating all of the systems together. And that is this kind of fluid balance and pH balance that takes place in our bodies all the time, ebbing and flowing just like the tides. So before we get into the mechanics of understanding how pH balance and fluid balance works, we have to understand where the fluid is in our body and in our cells. So we're gonna first start slowly this chapter, just looking at where fluid exists, where the solutes exist, where things are just kind of like a nuts and bolts inventory, if you will, of all of these things. So let me switch to screen share mode so that you can see this. And I apologize, I feel like I'm gonna sneeze any minute. The tree pollen, as I'm making this lecture today is out of control. My eyes are puffy, everything's just terrible. So I apologize. Let's talk about the overall components of our body as a whole. So obviously our body is made of mostly water and that water is distributed into compartments. We call them fluid compartments. There's the intracellular fluid or ICF or cytosol, right? That's the stuff inside the cells, right? This is of highly variable um, volume. And depending on where uh, or what type of cell this is in the body, it's going to either be very, very high in water content or very, very low in water content. Something like an, an adipocyte, right, a fat cell, isn't going to have a lot of water in it because water and fat don't, you know, dissolve in one another. But something like a muscle cell uh, or a neuron is going to have a much higher water content. The extracellular fluid is the other fluid compartment in our body, and this is everything else. So we have the stuff inside the cells, and then we have the stuff outside of the cells. And the extracellular fluid component is more variable between males versus females. So whereas the intracellular fluid component is more variable just from cell to cell, the extracellular component is variable between genders. And... Um, that is, of course, the interstitial fluid. This is the blood plasma, right? This is our uh, cerebral spinal fluid, the CSF, right? That's all of these special types of fluids that we've talked about along the way that is not inside of cells, it's surrounding cells. So here's just an overall breakdown of males versus females. Females tend to have more um, uh, or less, rather, water content and more solute content as opposed to males having more water content, less sol uh, uh, solute content. Um, roughly males also have more intracellular fluid volume because they have more cells, right? They just have, their cells are bigger, especially muscle cells and things like that. That's just an overall body composition average, right? If you also look at this, this, uh, this picture also breaks down the percentage of intracellular fluid blood plasma, and other fluids in the body. So um, roughly plasma as a whole, meaning blood plasma and uh, lymphatic plasma, the, the stuff that's floating around our lymph, that is roughly um, a little bit less than 5% of our total blood fluid volume. Now, just like everything, you don't have to know specific percentages, but if I gave you a scenario and said, blah, 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 has a water content or an ICF content of X, which is high or which is low, then you would have to derive um, 
some information from the information that I gave you, but I wouldn't specifically ask you the percentages. So the solid components of our body, these are the organic and inorganic components like the proteins, the carbohydrates, right, the minerals. This is roughly 40 to 50% of our entire body mass, right? So the rest of it is water and then we have the solid components. So minerals, of course, are the inorganic component. And we've talked about the function of minerals before when we covered nutrition. Overall, minerals are acting as um, coenzymes, and um, they're also acting in our uh, electron transport system as those um, energy-carrying molecules, um, passing things down. Like I'm thinking of like the chromium and the zinc. Um, molecules. So here's a rough breakdown. The majority of our body, when we talk about solid components, is protein. S a smaller percentage is lipids, minerals, carbohydrates, and then the miscellaneous would be other um, other random components like some vitamins and and, um, and other substances like that, uh, urea, right? All all of those other things that we've mentioned that that don't quite fit into any of the other. Uh, categories here. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. We're going to keep moving and talk specifically about fluid balance. So when the water content remains stable over time, that is going to basically require a balancing of water in and water out, right? Water gains and water losses. So we gain water through absorption in the digestive tract as well as metabolic processes. Remember, the end product of aerobic respiration was water. So when your body's making ATP, it's also making water. So it's not just fluid content being brought in by our digestive tract. Meta metabolism plays a role as well. looking back at my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything um, with the fluids and solids part. So um, how is water lost? Well, we lose a lot of water in, in several ways. So that we can gain it in two ways, but we can lose it in several ways. So we can lose it obviously through urination. That's about 50% or so. And then we also lose water through feces as well as evaporation through sweat, right? Water is going to move by osmosis passively flowing down concentration gradients from high concentration to low concentration, either from the ICF to the ECF or the other way, ECF to the ICF. So I'm gonna be using those abbreviations just like that. So make sure that you understand intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid. That, that's what those letters stand for and you, you should be able to make that association at this stage in the game because we're pretty much done with all of A and P um, after this chapter, reproductive doesn't really, um, add too many uh, nuts and bolts to the equation. So this is overall chart straight from your book, covering fluid balance, where fluid comes from and how it gets eliminated, food, liquid, metabolic um, processes. Obviously the majority of the water comes into our body through um, our nutrition and our digestive system and the majority of it is eliminated through urination, but there are other ways as well. Um, so that would make probably a good multiple choice question. I don't know. It's not a hint, it's just a observation. All right, take a look at this. You can see um, dietary input of around 220 milliliters, just like always. You don't have to know numbers. This is just giving you a big picture. And then your salivary secretions are adding about 1,500 milliliters, gastric secretions adding more, right? Liver and bile and pancreatic juices and all those things are adding more. And then we're reabsorbing at this point. We're reabsorbing in the small intestine and in the large intestine. To, to minimize the amount of water that's being eliminated in our digestive tract. So those ICF and ECF compartments have to interact to create this nice balance, right? This is going to create um, a, a concentration gradient, which is gonna allow the water to flow in between. So just like everything that we've talked about this semester and last semester, where if we have a high, high blood pressure in the aorta and a low blood pressure in the left ventricle, it, ventricular ejection is not going to occur, right? The, the heartbeat can't happen if the pressure in the aorta is higher than the pressure in the left ventricle. Uh, it's the same thing here. You have to have a hot area of high pressure to move that water to an area of low pressure. So um, we create something called a fluid shift. This is the movement of water between the ECF and ICF, and this is 
obviously in response to osmotic concentrations and concentration gradients. This is going to occur rapidly to changes in the ECF um, osmotic concentrations. So let me see if I can uh, come up with a, okay, so your, your extracellular fluid is the fluid that's around your entire body, right? And so your intracellular fluid is just the individual cells. Imagine that some concentration is off in your extracellular fluid. That's going to impact your entire body. Let's say maybe it's a hydrogen ion concentration in that case, um, you know, affecting your pH, right? So if you have this, this change in concentration of hydrogen ions, excuse me, in your extracellular fluid, what happens in your body is a fluid shift from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. In other, why, in other terms, your individual cells will sacrifice themselves in order to maintain equilibrium in the extracellular fluid. So your extracellular fluid, even if some ion concentration or water concentration is off, your extracellular, or your intracellular fluid rather, is going to change either absorb or secrete, right, in order to keep that ECF at equilibrium. At all costs, it is super important that your body maintain equilibrium in that ECF, maintain stable conditions in the ECF. I'm talking here about pH specifically, as well as overall ion and fluid concentrations. So if individual cells will secrete more sodium or less sodium or more water or less water, more hydrogen or less hydrogen, right, in response to the ECF. It's all about keeping that ECF balanced and perfect, even if those, those cells themselves have to die in the process. Does that make sense? The cells themselves sacrifice for the overall good, so to speak, of the ECF and the entire body. Because if the blood concentration gets off, if the blood pH gets off, that's going to throw off everything and you could end up in a, a huge, uh, you know, stress condition where you're, where, you're, where you go into a coma or you possibly even die if those ion concentrations are not balanced. So the cells themselves will sacrifice for the ECF and, and do this fluid shift where they push things into the ECF or pull things out of the ECF in order to keep it balanced. This is going to allow the equilibrium to be reached within minutes um, or maybe even hours if there is some type of uh, imbalance going on. <coughs> so some factors that affect ECF. This would be a great graphic organizer, right? For those of you that are visual learners, Look at this picture, we see factors that affect ECF. I would have ECF at the top, and then I would have all of these little lines coming off of it and examples, right? Water reabsorption across digestive um, epithelium. Water loss through skin and lungs, right, through um, our respiratory system. Water loss in feces. Water secreted by sweat glands. Water lost in urine, right? Gaining metabolic water through the intracellular fluid, right? Those are all factors that are going to affect the volume of extracellular fluid that you have. Let's talk about what happens in times of dehydration. Dehydration will develop when your water losses are exceeding the water gains in your body. So water loss from your extracellular fluid is gonna increase the osmotic concentration in your ECF, right? If you don't have enough water, you have too many solutes, and so um, you know, you're gonna have this very hypertonic solution in your extracellular fluid. So what's gonna happen is that fluid shift occurs. Water's gonna move from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. That's gonna allow osmotic equilibrium to be re reached in the extracellular fluid. And now both fluids are slightly more concentrated, but overall, it's much better for your body because it's not, it's not as, um, concentrated as it was before. It's not as pronounced. That concentration gradient isn't as much as it was before. So if fluid imbalance continues and persists over a long period of time, loss of water from the ICF can produce the thirst, can produce dryness, wrinkling of skin, right? Things like that are going to result. And so you're going to get some input from your hypothalamus and those thirst centers and things like that saying we need to drink, right? Et cetera. 
continued fluid loss um, can cause a drop in blood volume. When we drop in blood volume, we drop in blood pressure. So this could lead to circulatory shock where, where your body is saying, wow, I just don't have enough blood plasma. My, uh, you know, the, the fluid levels in the blood are so low that the heart and circulatory system can't function as they need to. And that's when you're going to really, um, your heart rate's going to increase, your blood pressure is going to increase, your, your body's going to react very suddenly, um, very dangerously, which is why dehydration is such a dangerous condition. Here you see exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a visual person and you can't really in, envision all of these concentrations, take a look at it here. The ICF and the ECF are in balance in the beginning. If you have a, a loss of water in the ECF, maybe uh, you're not bringing enough fluid in, but you're sweating a lot for whatever reason. Look, now your ECF is more concentrated. So what happens is that ICF is going to shift fluid from the in, inside the cells to outside of the cells to uh, decrease this concentration gradient and go back to equilibrium. This is just the individual slides. I'm gonna pause the video here so that you have a chance to go back and review this section and um, really soak in, for lack of a better term, I guess pun intended, all of this information before we move on to the next section. I'll see you in a bit, bye.